And now, welcome Michael Shaban and Jonathan Letham. Hello. Hi there. We're actually doing something very dangerous <laughs> here. Have it, has it occurred to you? Because we, we're in this, we are very frequently confused for one another. <laughs> each other. Um, I, two weeks ago, I had a guy come up to me um, you know, with his hand over his heart, and he said, I just, I'm so excited to meet you. Your books have meant so much to me, especially Yiddish Policeman's Ball <laughs> and Motherless Brooklyn. <laughs> And that's I, only the latest. I'm thinking now I should write a book called Yiddish Policeman's Ball. <laughs> I mean, the title is available, and it's not, it's not bad. Um, I mean, we're just uh, perpetually cross-identified, misidentified, and to the point that the photo app on my computer, <laughs> you know how it will do face... I mean, we're friends. We've known each other for a long time, and it'll say, like, this is... Is this Michael? Is this... I yell it, and then it'll say, is this Michael? And it's, no, it's a picture of him. So, and I don't even think I, we I, look that I, much alike. I really. fully expect to be accidentally buried in your grave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could have yeah, just yeah. pretended <laughs> to be the other, and I wonder how many Well, we haven't we told have. them who we're claiming oh, to true. be yet, right? I'm Jonathan Lethem. <laughs> I'm Michael. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, <laughs> no, no, when I walked up, when I walked up, I haven't seen Michael in a little while. I said, oh, thank God I trimmed my beard just before coming. Because <laughs> um, it was a few days ago, it would have been even worse. But, um, um, I mean, maybe we, should, we could talk a little bit about um, why, things that we don't have in common, <laughs> things that we're not alike, yeah. or, or we could talk about the things we do have in common. Because I think the first time we ever met um, was at a book festival in, in Florida. Miami. Yeah. And um, I had read uh, Motherless Brooklyn, which had just come out the year before, and I had read some of Jonathan's earlier books. And we just dropped into this conversation. I don't know if you remember this, but we started talking about how the 1970s, um, people tend to think of it as this sort of disco and cocaine and, and all the things you think of with the 1970s, but to how there was this sort of like backwoodsy Jeremiah Johnson kind of strand to the way things were in the 70s and a lot of things were made out of wood and leather. <laughs> and I know we just fell into this conversation right away and, it, and we did discover there's this kernel of, of connectedness that's partly generational and the popular culture that we both grew up loving and admiring and um, similarities of temperament. Um, uh, there, there really is, a, it, it, there, whenever I do get misidentified as you, I don't have a sense of like outrage or like, <laughs> oh my God, again, I, I, there's always a part of me that goes like, well, of course, uh, duh, because yeah. there, there is a, there's a Yeah, connection. well, and, and probably as we get older, we're converging because of generational mm -hmm. things. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that I think about when I think about first meeting you is that uh, now we seem approximately to be two guys in the rearview mirror of, <laughs> of, of literary time. Mm -hmm. But when I first met you, you'd already been a famous writer to me and to the world for a long time. I, I was a bookseller uh -huh. selling your books uh -huh. when your first novels came out. Oh. And I was like, oh, there's a new guy in the firmament who's not me. <laughs> Um, one of these days, I'll stop being a bookstore clerk, and who is this fresh-faced, impudent guy, and, you know, um, and, uh, and is he any good? And then I read The Mysteries of Pittsburgh and was demolished by how brilliant it was, and I was like, okay, I guess there's a reason I'm the bookstore clerk, and he, you know. So when you, when you m greeted me so warmly at uh, the Miami Book Festival, I was also, that was a moment when I was first becoming welcomed by other writers. I hadn't had very many such encounters, mm -hmm. really. I mean, I'd, or I'd had them in a microcosm because I'd had a pre, uh, a kind of a kind of tidal pool version of a of, of a literary life, which is that I published science fiction stories in the traditional pulp magazines, and I'd gone to uh, conventions. Mm -hmm. So I'd fraternized with other science fiction writers, which was a kind of a really marvelous. Um, uh, for me, it went, in a way, it was like a farm team, a triple A version of. Right. I mean, for many people, that is the place to be. But I always knew that I wasn't quite situated. Uh, what would I say? I was incompletely situated there. Mm -hmm. So then when I wrote Motherless Brooklyn and some other kinds of readers and venues wanted to meet me, uh, I, was, I was excited in a new way. I was like I was a second. It was a second start for me. Well, I mean, we, 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 in a way, we've talked about this before, but we've had these kind of crisscrossing trajectories in some ways because I, I started out <laughs> being a writer wanting to be a science fiction writer thinking I would be a science fiction writer or fantasy um, writing science fiction 
stories that in some ways that there weren't comfortably science fiction any more than your science fiction was ever quite comfortably science fiction, but and not being certain about where that was gonna get me or where that was gonna lead me. And I went into this writing program at UC Irvine where you know the, the stories that I first turned into the MFA program under the inspiration of writers like J.G. Ballard and Italo Calvino and um, yeah, Ursula K. Le Guin um, were met with like to not just incomprehension, but with active resistance and yeah. like and distaste and and people. The kindest thing people said to me is, "I would like to be able to help you, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I can't because yeah. I hate science fiction. I don't like science fiction." So I jumped. Like I thought, yeah. okay, I'm in this You'd, program. Right. I, want, I need to be able to take advantage of these people who are here and they can help me and I do like to read mainstream fiction. I love Cheever and Fitzgerald and Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor and I have written in those modes before too so let me just stop this, put this to the side. I wrote The Mysteries of Pittsburgh which is pretty mainstream um, and then that's what I was doing then for the next little while after that even though I, had, I didn't intend and then I kind of have trekked backward, you know, not backwards, not the right word, but I made the, cr the, I went to the other side of the mountain and have gotten closer and closer to genre fiction as I've come along, yeah. whereas you've, you sort of went in another, the other way. Yeah, it's suddenly striking me that talking about what's similar but reverse, it's like a mirror image. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, 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 uh, it's pretty striking because I did, and of course your move was much more um, self-protective in a way. Right. I uh, decided perversely to, you know, at that moment, w which I experienced in, in c at college, mm -hmm. um, when people in a tr what was then a traditional literary context saw the stories I was writing precisely under the spell of Calvino, Stanislaw Lem, mm -hmm. Philip K. Dick, J.G. Ballard, uh, but also Kafka, mm -hmm. you know, um, Borges, they mm -hmm. were like, this isn't okay. We can't really get comfortable with mm -hmm. this, and especially since you're also mentioning American science fiction genre, which at that time, as my friend David Bowman later said to me, it's like you walked into the party with shit on your shoes. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Right. It was so in such disrepute, but I decided, I had the uh, counterculture ab reaction. I decided, you can't fire me, I quit. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be that person now uh, and prove you wrong, and I, cherished this ideal um, and talked about it all the time that you could come from there and then be so stu superbly uh, appealing a writer that it would demolish the, you know, I, that I was gonna single-handedly break the <laughs> curse, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, and I, I, I thought about a few careers that were examples, like Le Guin's, examples of kind of walking into the party with that shit on your right. shoes and still finally being like the bell of the that ball. That is the hardest way to do it. Yeah. The way that she chose or that you chose is I the decided that way. was my, my, my goal, was to prove them wrong instead of coming mm -hmm. uh, from the, you know, and, 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 and then I would just talk about it inordinately. I think I must have bewildered people because I was um, constantly saying, yeah, here's the plan. And they were like, that's a terrible plan. <laughs> because not only will the... Um, the, main, the quote unquote mainstream never welcome you on those terms. They'll never agree mm -hmm. that it's okay that you started over here. But the people in the genre are gonna be insulted that you're like uh -huh. trying to climb over their bodies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I was like, no, but I like them all. And right. I'm gonna be really friendly and garrulous and just make it okay. Right, and you're so not I, rejecting yeah. where you came from yeah. in that sense. So um, I think that what you just said points to another very significant difference between us, um, which is that Unlike you, I am a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and you are not a nice Jewish no, boy. But I, that's a frequent misconception yeah, about you that yeah, I think furthers yeah. people's tendency to Not just to the Jewish, but, but the nice. <laughs> the nice because <laughs> I, I think that it really is true that the simplest, deepest way to tell us apart is that you're much more of a pleaser than exactly. I am. And I, um, I usually uh, actually look for opportunities to remind people that I... Um, and un am uncomfortable or, or that something I feel or think might be uncomfortable to them, I don't smooth those things down. And the work reflects it, and I think my, my personality reflects it, and that's, that's the truth. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. my elders were, were telling me, you know, this is not going to work for us, and we can't um, help you. And I was like, okay, well, I'll make an yeah. adjustment. You're, so you're you a nice Jewish me. boy, and I'm a 
I'm a, I'm a, a dark Quaker guy. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you do? Well, how do what, like, I mean, so many people think you're Jewish. They say, and you get well, put on lists of Jewish writers. But I, I know your mother. I, that's was the thing is, born I, Jewish. I'm, I, I make it really that difficult. Makes you I, 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 what, what I have done is, is um, offer every contradictory cue because I've written about Jewish characters again and again, characters who are much more Jewish than I could ever mm -hmm. have a claim that's to being. And then again, on certain technical grounds, recognized universally, my mother was Jewish. Right. But she was third generation. Uh, secularized, you know, Kami. She was a red diaper baby. I was a paisley diaper baby. <laughs> uh, it was so distant from the world of identification that I was mm -hmm. growing up in. There, you know, I, was, I, was, I grew up in a hippie household. My father was a practicing Quaker, and I followed him into that practice for a while. Um, and I was a New Yorker, and, you know, but the trick is, when you're a New Yorker, you're also, uh, you know, the register of your sense of humor, your 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 food tastes mm -hmm. your your, sar your sarcasm registers as Jewish. So there's all these signifiers that go with that. But I you know I just really am very. Um, I actually was um, certified as not Jewish because I I was <laughs> I was once no this is a real story. I was once to marry uh, in in the Jewish practice and I went with my uh, bride to be to the to the rabbi mm -hmm. who had to agree to marry us under a chuppah, and after a conversation with me, he, he, he rejected you? He said, to the, he said to the family of the bride, I can't marry this person. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you didn't so get the So I'm actually like, unlike a lot of people who might have to wonder, like <laughs> Madeleine Albright, you know, <laughs> I know that I'm not Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> a rabbi, I'm like not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, do you we're not talking about writing at all. No, yet. we haven't. Yeah. The writing life. Yeah. That was our yeah. assigned topic. Yeah. The writing you know, life. We're, we're, we're also having a difficulty, which is that we're following George Saunders, oh. who was so stunningly oh brilliant God. and beautiful in everything I he said be about George the writing life that all I want to do is just paraphrase him in different I know. ways. <laughs> I know. Um, is, it, is it, you know, one thing I thought was interesting that, that they were talking about um, was this idea that the practice of writing... When we do it, when George does it, when anyone does it, if any of us do it, so if you do it long enough that it increases your empathy, do you think that's true? Well, I, I mean, empathy is a really charged issue right now, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's this whole system of relations between, you know, because we're in a very oppositional world. Mm -hmm. And um, empathy is often offered as a kind of um, a path to the middle in an oppositional world. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm very anxious about paths to the middle these days. And what I think about instead that works for me, and this is, again, to fail to talk about writing itself mm -hmm. specifically, but we'll find our way back there. I just think about another word that, that George offered that I really like, which is kind kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a Henry James quote that I, th I think about all the time um, where he said there are just three things in life. Uh, be kind, be kind, mm -hmm. be kind. Mm -hmm. And Or Vonnegut said, God damn it, babies, just be kind. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I've, also, I've also seen it described exactly in the same formulation as uh, the, Henry, the Henry James to Mr. Rogers. So, mm -hmm. so yes. Henry James said a thing that you could that you could pretend Mr. Rogers said: yeah. "Be kind, be kind, be mm -hmm. kind." But the three in it is what interests me, because I I've puzzled over that that little trick, the little stunt of three, and I thought, why are there three? And I and I thought, there's three to point out that we already know how to do two of them. Mm -hmm. We can be kind to babies mm -hmm. and animals if we're not sociopaths. Mm -hmm. Like we know to be kind to helpless things that are under our care. And we can be kind at the end to the dying parent, mm -hmm. no matter what their intimate crimes right. in our lives. Mm -hmm. we, can be, we can take care of people when they're helpless again. It's the middle kind, mm -hmm. the, 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 the kind that we're searching for in the space. Uh, and that's maybe different from empathy, because empathy uh, argues that you need to think that someone's thinking makes sense to you. And does it, I mean, does it, or is it simply a matter of saying, um, 
I can't, for example, torture this person or throw them right. off, well, the, off of the, their medical the care. The bottom lines of, of empathy, absolutely, mm -hmm. of course. But also, the practice of thinking in a kind way about the people who you are having difficulty empathizing with, mm -hmm. I think that slight gap for me is, is now where, you know, that I, I want to just imagine them either on their deathbed or as a child. I mean, that sounds really <laughs> gross, but, mm -hmm. but could I get there where mm -hmm. it's like, and of course the difference, what's the difference? Why is the middle kindness difficult? It's because of the uh, power relation. Mm -hmm. They might have power over you. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult. And, but naming it is a path, not to the middle, to some averaged out, well, the truth lies somewhere between these oppositional places, mm -hmm. but that the kindness would matter anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think in a way, empath I mean, empathy is a very commendable, admirable thing that we are in very short supply of, generally speaking, but it, to me, it's ultimately a, it's about imagination. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's what's required, first of all, to write your way into another imagined human's life yeah. and their, their circumstances. And that's something that I think writers, that is a faculty that writers call upon repeatedly in their work, but I, what I think is great is that it's also the faculty that's most called upon in readers, that yeah. the reader is participating in that act of imagining what it's like to be another person, what it might be like to be another person. And I do, I, I mean, I do think the more you are able and willing to imagine yourself into another, without, and empathy almost is a secondary result of that. It's simply the things you need to do just to imagine what it might be like to be the person. Yeah, I think maybe my, my, my resistance border. to empathy as the goal is that it actually, um, it's, it's like a placeholder. Mm -hmm. It's like between the, 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 the acceptance of a real other, mm -hmm. the confrontation with difference, mm -hmm. that's not fe a fear confrontation, but a, okay, I'm, I'm with you mm -hmm. in this moment, and the total mind meld that you're describing, which is, I mean, that's it. A book is a device, a novel is a device for making two brains temporarily confused mm -hmm. and, and intimately confused, mm -hmm. not just empathic, like, oh, now I see how you mm -hmm. feel, but I am you right, right now. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll never be the same because I spent some time being you. Mm -hmm. And that's a mind meld. It's much more than empathy. It's actually three in a way because it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the writer, the reader, and the character often. Yeah. And you're sort of, you know, as, you're, as a reader, at, at the, with the best writers, I feel myself not only completely immersed in the life that I'm being invited into, but I also feel, you feel like you're in dialogue with the writer, even yeah. if it's an imagine, your, it's your imagined construction of the writer. But the writer, writers are my friends. The writers I love most, I feel like they're my friends. And they've been my friends my whole life, if it's Arthur Conan Doyle or Edgar Allan Poe or um, uh, Michael Andache, who's actually a friend of mine in real life. But yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a, when I go back to their books, I feel like I'm going over to a friend's you're, house. You're spending time in there. And that's a Im totally imagined relationship. It doesn't yeah. e really exist. And I think, you know, but on the other hand, when I was listening to them talking about this sort of the ameliorative power of, of, that kind of imagining of and of empathy, but then and then um, the interviewer Coy said something like, you know, what would it be like if we all were writers? Like if everyone was a writer? And you know, I mean, there are two things I thought of while they were talking that I've thought of before. Is like if if um, if writing really is that does strengthen that muscle, then why are so many writers assholes? Mm, yeah, <laughs> um, and. Two, um, then just imagine the world where if I mean, everyone's a writer. I, first of all, I don't know if there's enough how couches. How many agents would you need? Exactly. Um, uh, who would be the agents? Who would be the agents? And then you need a some lot of, of sofas. Some of them would have to be really angry writers pretending to be agents. Mm -hmm. But um, no, seriously. I, I mean, that, it's funny you made that joke, which is not a joke, about why can writers then be assholes if they're engaged in this sublime operation all mm -hmm. the time. And um, mm -hmm. it also reminds me of a, a joke that's not a joke that Karen uh, Joy Fowler once made, where uh -huh. she said... You know, every kid is cute. Everyone opens their wallet and it shows me their adorable kid and I, or sends me a you know, little video file and I'm like, I, I love your kid. But 
some of them must be growing up to be the adults that I hate. <laughs> yeah, how does you that know, like when does it when does the conversion happen? Uh-huh. And then what, uh-huh. <laughs> um, That's funny. So, um, I another thought that I want to follow on and is um, this idea of the book. It's a it's a space that the 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 minds meld in, but that is genuinely a participatory, active. Uh, you know, um, experience, and uh, I heard, um, and I don't know, maybe this is even a backdoor into why are art writers assholes. I mm-hmm. don't know if if, if I'm going to get at what you mean there. Some of them, but but um, so I I heard, uh, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, the author of Exit West, Mosin Hamid. Yeah, beautiful, oh, beautiful book, book and remarkable so speaker, and he and he said. I seemingly spontaneously, it was probably the kind of shtick I have, and he just did a good job of making it seem spontaneous. <laughs> he said, I don't really write novels, I write half novels. Hmm. The, 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 the reader writes the other half. And this Beautiful. made me think also of George saying, if you furnish the room completely, it's a hotel room and someone might like to visit it and admire it, but it's mm-hmm. not theirs. If you mm-hmm. leave space for them to put things mm-hmm. in, then mm-hmm. they move in and it's theirs. And I thought, yes, half novels, that's what I do. That's why I like to leave certain things underdescribed, and my editors are off, often push me to describe things I've chosen not to, mm-hmm. and I actually don't have the answer. They'll say, "What does this person's face look like? Mm-hmm. Could you just tell us?" And I think I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I o- often also face this question with, "What happened to your character after the end of the last page?" If you write an endearing novel, I wrote one endearing novel, Motherless Brooklyn. People say, "Oh, Lionel, what happened to him later? Yeah. You know, did he ever get a girlfriend?" And I'm yeah. like, "I don't know." <laughs> I don't know anything about what happens after that last page. That's the space that the reader's imagination moves into mm-hmm. and completes. Mm-hmm. But I, then I took that thought one step further and I thought, I write half novels because I am a half person. Mm. Writers are very incomplete mm. people. And they write these books that we complete, but then they have to come out of their rooms and walk around the world, and it's frustrating and sometimes makes you really into a very unpleasant person to meet, to be so incomplete. Mm-hmm. You're in a state of wondering, and work. you're like a work site, you know, it's like the big dig in Boston. Someday there's going to be a whole person here, mm-hmm. we promise you. <laughs> but actually, being a writer maybe is about, uh, it's, um, I'm not sure what I just heard you say, but... Oh, I just love that line. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there's an idea in science called neoteny. Yeah. Um, neoteny is a, sounds esoteric. It's an idea from evolutionary science that some species advance, or anyway, some new uh, creatures emerge from staying in the child form of some other creatures, which is, sounds really weird. But like, you can think about neoteny as being like we we resemble the babies of certain ape species much more than we resemble the adults. Mm-hmm. We're not as strong physically. Our heads are big and our bodies are smaller. Mm-hmm. We have less hair, mm-hmm. and dogs resemble dogs puppies. resemble the puppies yeah. of wolves. Right. That's neoteny. Well, maybe writers are a little bit neotenous. <laughs> like we're kind of holding on to some very uh, clumsy, childlike parts of ourselves in order to do this work. Mm-hmm. And that's also, you know, there. This goes back to Karen Fowler. The children are also sometimes assholes mm-hmm. because they don't know how to function mm-hmm. being half people yet. You know. I mean, I, I. I I do think, and I think George was suggesting, maybe suggesting something like this too, that when you write, when I'm writing, I'll just say, I'm a much better person yeah, than course. when I'm not writing. I'm much smarter. I'm much, uh, I have much more empathy. I can see farther. I can understand yeah. things that were said and done in my own past or stories that I've heard from other people uh, about things that happened in their past that, that, that seemed purely to be a case of some kind of abuse or some kind of outrage or, or right. whatever or dis- disregard and then I can look and see no actually I get what was going on there to have that kind of and all the the thing that um, uh, uh, what's it called the l'esprit de l'escalier like or in Yiddish it's called trepverter like when you think of the thing as you're on your way down the stairs that you should have said yes yeah, so 2020 20 20 hindsight 2020 20 hindsight like, like the mad magazine version of it exactly yeah. <laughs> when you're a f- when you're writing yeah. you're in yeah. full possession Monday morning quarterbacking that. yeah that. that's it so you're, the whole job is Monday morning quarterbacking yeah. but and yeah. you have the time and the leisure and the opportunity yeah. and you can say all the things you wish you had said and 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 you can have things come out the way and, to have and you can look at others the way you wish you were looking exactly. at them when you walked around exactly. 
exactly. uh, life, you know, uh, in full and stopping and just embracing them mm -hmm. and, and being like, oh, you know, it, you can be, you can look at everybody with the middle kindness. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, rather with the, the first and the last kindness, mm -hmm. even the middle people, even the villains in your book, you can look at them with the kindness of, your, you know, your baby, you're kind of a baby, mm -hmm. you're a child. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. even when it's a certain, when, it, when it, there's a, I might be looking back and trying to sum up in a short story an entire period of my life and by choosing one particular moment and then finding ways to fictionalize it and they actually make it into an interesting story. And in the process of doing that, suddenly a person that I knew for a long period of time that I never actually sort of sat and thought about and added up all the pieces of them, they just coalesce and you get that kind of understanding. And even if it's not like you're presenting them as now a wonderful person or the hero of the story, they can still have done the same kind of harmful or negative thing. There's a, what, you, what I am able to find is the ways in which they're, I'm like that too, and that we're yeah. all like that, and we have the same sort yeah. of, so that's, yeah. then you come out of that mode and you're still the same old idiot, yeah, making right. the same mistakes you know, and not forgiving people when they need to be forgiven. And, right. Mm -hmm. there, there, you know, there's another truism about writing, and I don't know who the or originator of this is. Maybe it was Mr. Rogers, but that <laughs> you write to, um, to disturb the uh, comfortable and to comfort the disturbed. Whoa. Do you know this Let me one? think about that. No. Okay. Some, yeah, somebody like was it. asked, why do they write? To disturb mm -hmm. the comfortable and mm -hmm. comfort the disturbed. And again, in my typical way... Wait, we have a theory about who it might have been. Who's the afflicted? <laughs> Afflict the comfortable well, and comfort, comfort the, the afflicted. afflicted. That's oh. even... Great. Magazine or the, the person? The, the Mother Jones. Oh, the... Yeah. Right. Great. I love that. Well, I always think, and you know what I else? I love it if I, Mr. Rogers had said I that. thought, no, it wasn't. It def <laughs> definitely wasn't Mr. Rogers. Um, I played the piano to comfort the afflicted. <laughs> Friday the 13th um, yeah. said that. You yeah. are my afflicted, <laughs> and you're special. But no. Um, but what I wanted to say is, just like the thought about my reader, the book is a half book. My reader completes it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that means I'm a half person. Right. I thought, I always think, oh, and you know what? I'm on that team too. I write to comfort my afflicted self mm -hmm. or disturbed self and to disturb my complacent or comfortable mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. I'm also in the, in the room mm -hmm. uh, on both scores there. Should we take questions? Let's take questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh. Take the aspect of uh, empathy and add in the dimension of tension. Ten tension. Do you, you mean, mean in a piece of writing? Yeah. Oh, intention or tension? Tension. tension. Just anxiety and yeah. crisis and conflict. The thing that everyone will tell you first in a writing workshop, this is needs, story needs conflict. Mm -hmm. I think that is pretty much almost automatic. It just has to be unearthed because you have people in a room, you have conflict and anxiety and neurosis. And, and it is true that a lot of young writers, I'm, I'm in Georgia's situation, I teach young writers a lot, um, uh, don't put it in. But it's not because it isn't implicit in the situations they're writing, they just tamp it down. Mm -hmm. They put in all the safety stuff because they don't want anyone to feel bad. So they write stories about unhappy people who are just okay and sit around and don't, <laughs> don't make trouble. Or mean people who never say anything mean. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is point out, look, you really want to put, you really want to take the cork off this. But to, to put two humans in a space, in history, in you know, in a in a political reality, in a in a you know psychosocial reality, in gender relations, is to find tension and crisis and conflict everywhere. So, you know, it's it's just um, it's the stuff of 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 the human. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's when you're most you're most called on to be empathetic, it, and when it's most difficult is in those moments where it would be very easy to sort of look at the superficial behaviors and say this person's being mean or this person's being cruel or that person's being inconsiderate um, or two people are getting into an argument and um, you know that's when you that's when it's most required that you stop as a writer if you're trying to write that scene and say well if I were this other person I'm, I'm writing I'm say I'm drawing on a version of an experience that I had it's so easy to 
to stay in the fictional role that's closest to me and my own experience, but I'm gonna actually write this story from the other person's yeah. point. There's a cliche that you should give the devil the best lines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, you know, um, writing against what you feel and know, as, I mean, you know, this is a form of rigor and a form of examination and a form of, uh, of, um, uh, of truthfulness. I think mm -hmm. George was using that term truth a lot in that last session, but it's also a craft, it's craft advice. If you, because the opposite would be what might be called shooting fish in a barrel. Mm -hmm. You're just settling scores and proving things you already know and are com comfortable, reassuring you and your reader that you're better than this other thought or, mm -hmm. or attitude. Yeah. Right. And um, letter written, a beautiful letter written to Oprah Winfrey to withdraw her support of that book. Can you have opinions or want to talk about appropriations? Uh, you know, I haven't read the book, so I feel like. Well, oh, it's a question about American yeah. dirt. I just, I feel like there, for me, there are too many people commenting about it without having read it. And so I don't want to include myself in that group, but. Yeah, you take the words out of my mouth. I've just always been very cautious to notice if I'm starting to have an opinion about a, a book or a film or anything that I haven't experienced. Um, I haven't read the letter. I haven't read the news stories. Like, I, I have no knowledge. Yeah, the, the, the dynamic. Well, so the topic of appropriation, I think, is in a way starting to be uh, implicit in one of Michael's descriptions, which is that, as, you know, and I always just index, I try to index not as a writer and author who wants to, you know, have elbow room and, you know, gets all justified or defiant about you know, people telling me what I can and can't do, but what the core of the experience of wanting to tell stories is for me, the index is my reading life and my, the kernel of my reading desire, my appetite to transmigrate my, my soul into this other person, into any, anything but myself, mm -hmm. to be surprised and, and delighted and threatened and challenged and weirded out by otherness was uh, this drive as a reader. So I don't think I can uh, imagine um, not wanting to also uh, experience that in my writing life. It's not even that I, I'm therefore like, that I want the right therefore to give other people that mm -hmm. feeling that I had. It's more like my reading and my writing are so closely connected that inventing stories, t making up characters, telling tales for me is a continuation of that appetite to be other than myself. And I think that really without putting in some sort of ethical practice like, and that's why we'll all be better people after we read novels, mm -hmm. it's just really about a desire that I've, I think funds the whole the whole space of my of my work. Yeah, I mean it's it's about escape. That's the way I put it. Like I love as a reader first, and then as a writer, it's this constant effort to just get out of here and get into another life, um, and to know. And that's why I turned to reading at initially. That's why I think a lot of us turned to reading. And that term escape escapism is often used in a pejorative sense, but I think it lies at the root of of almost all of our initial motivations for why you start reading is to just, you're trapped in here for your whole life. There's actually no way to get out. But the closest way, the only way we've come up with ever to approximate that, I think, is through the experience of reading. And, and then through writing um, is just a, is a version of reading in many ways for me. So, but I mean, I think, you know, as in all things in life, one of your primary duties is to recognize your limitations acknowledge your limitations, and do everything you possibly can to overcome those limitations, and then be willing to be judged on those limitations. If you're gonna put something out there um, for other people to read and evaluate, uh, um, then um, you, know, you have to understand that there's gonna be some kind of relationship between the amount of effort you've put into overcoming your limitations and the degree to which various kinds of readers are gonna read what you've produced and say, you didn't do a good enough job. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's totally fair and reasonable to, 
to expect that someone who is going to judge you or judge your work for having exceeded its, your inherent limitations or not to have actually read the work, I think, is like a minimum <laughs> requirement. Hi. Yeah, I, it, I, I'll never, I always pine for the glory days. In my mid-teens to th really the en through the end of my 20s, probably there was a 15-year period when it was, I could credibly say that I was, you know, reading, I was putting away, uh, you know, 10 to 20 books of different kinds, mostly novels, in a month. You know, and it, it just was, that was, that, and that's still the slag heap in my mm -hmm. brain. That's where all the energy, that's mm -hmm. the radioactive pile. And I try to add stuff to it out of that same spirit of selfish interest and appetite. But one of the things that falls upon you as a, uh, an author is a lot of dutiful reading. And I don't mean that you're necessarily reading bad things when you're doing dutiful reading. Reading friends' manuscripts in galleys and commenting on them. Reading, in my case, reading my students' writing or rereading texts that I'm teaching in the classroom, because right now I'm teaching Kafka's The Castle. In a few weeks, I'll start teaching Darce Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Those are incredible reading experiences. But in every case, whether it's for a blurb or for a student or to, to help someone with their manuscript or because I'm studying something or I'm going to write an essay or, or, or a review of it, there's an external conscience. There's a superego saying, what do you think of it, and what are you going to say about it when, it's, mm -hmm. when your reading's done, which mm -hmm. is so different from the absolutely, excuse the term, but kind of masturbatory glee of just gobbling down stories and language <clears throat> only for myself because of the appetite. Mm -hmm. And I try to return when I can to that space where I, something, I just think, I bet I would have a good time with that. I bet I'll have trouble, like, stopping reading it, and I'll, I'll, I'll like, you know, want to stop looking at my email. Mm -hmm. And I try to reconnect with that as frequently as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's similar in, in many ways with me. I'm in starting with that kind of golden peak period and, you know, reading constantly, always with a book, walking down the street, falling into a ditch because I was reading while I was walking, um, going to the library and checking out a pile of books and then reading them as fast as I could and taking them back to the library. Um, now, most of my reading is, t tends to be either um, two kinds, either going back and rereading writers that um, I have this ongoing kind of relationship with, and always, it's to me, every time I go back to a writer that I already know, I've, I love, I've gotten a lot out of their work, I go back partly in that, at this point, the expectation I'm gonna discover something that wasn't present to me when I was 30 and I read um, the English Patient, and then I read it again when I was 40, and I read it again when I was 50, and every time I've read it, I've, it's been a different book to me. That in itself is a kind of pleasure I get from reading that I couldn't have imagined getting when I was uh, young and reading. And, um, and then I also, most of my reading diet tends to be related in some way to whatever project I'm working on, whatever book I'm writing. Or, and it can be fiction still. I might be reading novels where I either have been told or I understand or I remember that the writer was wrestling with a way of handling time, yeah. the passing of time, and I have to do something complicated with the passing of time. So like you go back and reread To the Lighthouse you know, to see how she does that, that incredible middle chapter where all the years go by in yeah. 25 pages or whatever it is to, to, to study, in a sense. Um, so I, I'm either reading novels where I, I'm hoping to get insight into problem solving that I'm facing, how to handle a certain thing only through dialogue. So maybe I'll go back and look at some Elmore Leonard or Richard Price or another writer whose dialogue I consider to be the, kind of the goal for dialogue, um, or nonfiction that is the period I'm writing about or a, a social phenomenon that I'm writing about or whatever. It might be a scientific concept I'm dealing with and then I'll read to s help educate myself. And I mean, that's my primary, one of my primary goals, I guess, now for reading in a way that it was when I was young was it used to be purely for pleasure and education was like a side effect. And now it's more often for education either because I'm looking for help in solving a particular writing problem from a great 
master or else um, to help me make my work better in some other way. Hi. Hi. Um, so Saunders wrote, uh, talked about revision almost at, uh, in a reverential way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about revision in your work? Sure. Sh shall, shall I start? Yeah. I mean, it, it is. It's, it's so uh, becomes the... I mean, first of all, of course, I think about it the way George <laughs> spoke as something I'm imparting. It's, it's the primary thing I teach. When people ask you, how can you teach writing? The answer, of course, you know, the judo move is to say, you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can teach uh, revision. And even before that, I think of myself as a teacher of a practice that sounds like a duh, like anyone can do that, which is reading yourself. You know, my, my students, and, and of course I mean myself too, we, we, we write believing that we're saying one thing or believing we're even interested in one thing and, and believing, con convincing ourselves in order to keep going, I'm getting it, I'm nailing it, it's all landing, I'm making this work. And you think... You know, every time you think at the end of the first draft, you know, I know I'm supposed to revise, but I think I got it all. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's probably just all there. Mm -hmm. And then you come down off the Kool-Aid and you <laughs> breathe mm -hmm. and you read what's actually landed on the page. Mm -hmm. And that is your teacher. And that's not an easy practice. So what I teach in the writing classroom and what I practice for myself is the art of reading yourself, not what does Jonathan Leatham tend to write like, and he did it again, you know, look at that, but what landed? What, what are these words saying? What are these characters like once they came out of my brain mm -hmm. and into language? What are they doing? What do they want? Uh, you know, what is this style trying to claim, or what is it hiding? And confronting my own draft as a reader precedes even the revision act, just absorbing it and saying, wow, uh, he believes that? Do I believe that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or he wants this? Mm -hmm. uh, who or, wrote you know, this? Who wrote this? And, <laughs> and, 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 and sometimes it's really also surely a question of interest. Oh, I thought I was terrifically interested in mm -hmm. making this thing happen. Mm -hmm. Well, when it landed, that was not energized, but some other thing was coming to life, some other relation. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's what this chapter is, is for. So it's really about abiding with your own results in material language, paragraphs, sentences, scenes, set pieces, chapters, and saying, wow, okay, I can make that better, but first I have to even see what it, what it turned out to be. Um, I mean, you mentioned sentences, and, and that's really the key for me is I hate the first time through. Like the first draft is not even the right word. Just the first, like, okay, I have to sit down and I know I've got to write this scene where the characters finally meet, whatever it is. That first time through is so painful for me. I hate every minute of it. I get it down. The second time through is pleasure. Like, once it's there and I have a chance to evaluate the kinds of things that Jonathan's talking about, but once it's, once it's done, I can relax. Like, okay, it, I got something... I can work with now. To go back and to start rewriting is pleasurable for me. It's like sanding, you know, if you do fine carpentry or something, like when you're just trying to get that to be smooth and see the grain come out. Um, and then to go back a third time is even more pleasurable. And each time I go back, it's much more pleasurable than the previous time and far more pleasurable than the first time. So what I've learned to do is work one sentence at a time. So I get that. So it feels less daunting and horrible to imagine this whole new chapter, this whole new scene I have to write that's going to be so painful. Uh, just, I'll just try to start one sentence. I'll just get that sentence, and I'll rewrite it right there, and then rewrite it again, and rewrite it a few times so I have a sense of, okay, I'm, I'm enjoying myself now, and then go to the next sentence. And... Um, really just proceed one sentence at a time. Now, sometimes it happens fast. Like, the, the whole thing from the first bit to the rewrites is a matter of seconds, um, and other times it's hours. But one sentence at a time. And yeah. speaking and of time, that's us. Out. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks for listening. <laughs>